First off, I'm not here to like or dislike the Acolyte. To each its own. I care about the overall lore of Star Wars, and if you've already watched my channel's videos, you'll know that. You'll never find me hating on anything, even my haters. I love all of you. That's probably why my channel will never be huge. I refuse to hate on Disney. I have more Star Wars to watch than ever before. I love the lore. So now we see what happened from Osha's point of view. May started the fire, however, we didn't see burn marks on the witches' bodies, and they are all dead. That tells me the Jedi had something to do with that, and we will learn that throughout the course of the Acolytes season. One of the bright spots is we learn a little more about the Force. I use bright spot loosely. Remember, Qui-Gon, a Jedi Master, introduced the idea that the Force can be unusually strong within individuals who have a larger than normal amount of special microscopic creatures in their body cells. Ever since, many Star Wars fans have been bothered by this addition to the lore, complaining that this new explanation for the Force turned a power they'd long thought of as profoundly mystical and attainable by anyone with the proper training into something limited to folks with the right genes. Other Star Wars fans will counter that midi-chlorians are just one way someone can be strong in the Force. But that's irrelevant to the point I want to make about all this, which is, what if Qui-Gon was wrong? What if the Jedi's whole understanding of the Force in the prequel trilogy is misguided, going hand-in-hand -hand with their ultimately foolhardy obsession with science and order in those films? Following that same logic, let's jump back to 100 years earlier. In this week's episode of The Acolyte, titled Destiny, we get an extended flashback to the childhood of Osha and May just before they were separated by tragedy. On the planet Brendok, these two lived a life of exploration and harmony with nature, under the eye of a coven of witches, led by Anasea, the one said to have created them, and Koril, the one who carried them. At one point in this episode, Anasea explains the Force to her two children as a kind of cosmic thread that can be tugged on by anyone who knows how. Two people tugging is better than one. More is better still. Destiny doesn't resolve the question of what the Force actually is. Instead, it's about two groups of zealots fighting over the future of two potential, well, acolytes. The Jedi have sensed that Osha and May are remarkably Force-sensitive, and because the Order has concerns, they want to test these kids. If the sisters pass, the Jedi want to whisk them away to Coruscant and feed them into their Jedi brainwash mill. So based on Episode 3, we are back to anyone can use the Force if they know how. This is exciting because a majority of the Star Wars fans want everyone to be able to use the Force as long as they can learn how. This basically tells me that the Jedi Order and everybody else in the galaxy really do not understand how the Force works. And I am glad they are showing how they thought 100 years before The Phantom Menace. By having no one know exactly what the Force is, it still makes it a mystery and allows me to lay in my bed and practice moving items off of my end table. I'm a nerd and I do that. One day I will be strong with the Force. Now, one thing that Acolyte is proving is the idea of light and dark, like we've learned throughout all other Star Wars media. This brings me to Legends. Tython is part of the established Star Wars canon, thanks to a collection of Star Wars comics such as Marvel's Darth Vader and Dr. Aphra series. However, the planet's most notable appearance was in live action with The Mandalorian Season 2 when Grogu meditates on the Seeing Stone before his capture by the Imperial Remnant. However, the significance of Tython's moons has largely remained part of the non-canon legends so far. In Legends, it was said ancient Jedi reflected on the nature of Ty Tython's moons, named Ashla and Bogan. This helped them develop the concepts of the light and dark side aspects of the Force. To that end, Ashla and Bogan are the original names for the light and dark side, a fact that was made canon thanks to Star Wars Rebels when they were named as such by the mysterious Force-sensitive being known as the Bendu, a powerful entity claiming to represent the center between the two. As such, Brendok's moons do seem to serve as a key parallel to the moons of Tython. Keeping the narrative connection to Tython and its moons in mind, it certainly seems as though Brendok's moons point to a core truth about the dark side of the Force. Just like Ashla and Bogan, Brendok's moons look to be in a natural orbit, existing simultaneously while likely representing the two different aspects of the Force itself. This would suggest that the dark side is just as natural as the light side, 
a necessary aspect of the force that must be acknowledged and can't ever be eradicated fully. Both are needed in order to achieve true balance in the force. It's no coincidence that Osha and Mei were born as twins through the power of the force and that their ascension ceremony is happening on a world containing twin moons. The narrative parallels are in full force, including the idea that despite the fact that Osha and Mei end up taking very different paths as they grow up, their destinies are clearly tied to one another. Even as the lines between good, bad, and light, dark are likely going to continue to be blurred as the series continues. It's also notable that Brendock's moons in the Acolyte Episode 3 were seen eclipsing each other and nearing an alignment. This suggests that the witches of Brendock, led by Mother Anasea, believe in balance rather than one aspect over another. This also likely connects to their force philosophy, that the energy field that binds all living things in the galaxy is in truth a great thread that connects all, allowing for the power of one to become greater through the power of two, and subsequently the many, like with a coven of united witches. Osha ultimately rejects this idea represented by Brendock's moons. While Mei is inducted into the coven, Osha chooses instead to become a Jedi after the ascension ceremony is interrupted by four Jedi who request to test both girls. Osha eventually becomes the apprentice to Jedi Master Sol, and it can't be a coincidence that Sol is Latin for son. However, it's likely going to be important that Osha didn't stick with her Jedi path as was revealed in the Acolyte's premiere, suggesting that regaining the balance could be her endpoint, and perhaps May's as well as the Star Wars show continues. This is exciting because throughout this series, we may learn more about the Force, the light and dark side, and the balance. What did you think of the episode's lore? I don't care if you hated it. Dig a little deeper and tell me what you think of the tugging at a thread ideology. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. Hit that subscribe button and we'll see you next time. You have failed me for the last time.